वेलकम टू नेटवर्क स्टडी दिस इज द एडिटोरियल एनालिसिस ऑफ फिफ्थ सेप्टेंबर ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री लेट स्टार्ट टू डिस्कस थ्री एडिटोरियल टू फ्रॉम हिंदू एंड वन फ्रॉम इंडियन एक्सप्रेस द फर्स्ट एडिटोरियल इज रिगार्डिंग वन नेशन एंड वन इलेक्शन आइडिया दैट हैज बीन प्रपोज बाय गवर्नमेंट दिस एडिटोरियल इज रिटर्न बाय प्रवीण चक्रवर्ती एंड मिस्टर शशि तरूर एंड समेर इन दिस एडिटोरियल दे हैव गिवन पॉइंट अगेंस्ट दिस कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ वन नेशन एंड वन इलेक्शन there are some good points you can use it in your answers if the question comes regarding criticize the idea of one nation and one election where you can use these points to criticize this move uh, let's get into the discussion of this one the proposal of one nation one election is given by the government government want to conduct election for both lok sabha and uh, assembly state assembly elections together not only not only the one or two states it's uh, cumulatively all the states elections are going to conducted along with the lok sabha elections only so this is the concept of one nation and one election but the author here in this article uh, somewhere he mentions that this idea is unimplementable it is very difficult to implement and there are flaws in this ideology also if you look at various state as assembly government the term and tenure are different some state governments have 2 years tenure some the state governments have 4 years tenure so it is differing throughout the country and how can it possible to conduct a election together all at once so this would be administratively very hectic and this idea is unimplementable this is what the author talks about and author has here in this article they have given reasons that why this idea of one nation one election has some flaws for our democracy let's first see what government argument is see government is arguing the first argument of government is uh, country seems like always be in a permanent campaigning there will be election in some or other state and it won't let government to work properly government even the opposition parties administrative machinery for that matter state political parties also they will be in a mood of uh, campaigning throughout the year so this is the first reason and the second thing it says that it takes enormous fiscal resources and it takes enormous amount of time from the government if you look at indian past history india has either had state government or national go- election national election every year from past 36 years see every year there will be one election either for a state government or for a lok sabha election or some other kind of elections are going on continuously from past 36 years every year there will be one election so this is going to have a huge financial burden and it is going to affect even uh, government administrative machinery also so this is the second reason the third reason is the model code of conduct comes into effect as soon as the election schedule has been uh, announced and because of this model code of code of conduct it distracts the government government has to stop some of the policies with respect to this model code of conduct and also it, because of this it is going to lead the policy paralysis till the elections are over there are restriction from the election commission of india side so government cannot go for a developmental projects or developmental activity somewhere this is going to lead to the policy paralysis see these are the reasons government are giving that because of all these reasons we are pushing for the idea of one nation one election scheme if one nation one election if the single election happens in the country so next 5 years it gives time for the government to work for the policy formulation and policy implementation we don't have to worry about model code of conduct and also financial burden will also be reduced so these are the points now the authors here they have given reasons that why this idea is not good and why it is unimplementable in our country yeah here in this article there are five reasons have given let's go through uh, one by one the first reason why this idea is flawed the first reason the article gives is see india is not going to face election every year lok sabha elections will be 5 years once but only particular state is going to face the elections when it comes to the assembly election and this model code of conduct it is going to affect only that particular state only it is not going to affect the entire country and what government is telling that because of model code of conduct this is going to affect the developmental project of the country no it is not the case government is giving the misinformation here developmental projects are going to affect only for that particular state that too for a very short span of time and another thing is 
uh, other argument of government is all major political parties are going to be busy in uh, election campaigning only and they will not be part of active participant of a nation building process and here author says that no this uh, this argument is also not true see all the po political parties will be busy in this state uh, assembly election this is not the true only those political parties only those regional parties who are associated with that particular state they will be busy and that too again for that only span of that election process and now what now the next question comes if you look at the recent trend even the municipal election and panchayat election this uh, tier 3 elections they are also gaining importance and how will you find solution for that are you going to conduct those elections also along with uh, uh, assembly elections and the lok sabha elections is it feasible and this is not a solution that uh, you are going to have one election for the entire country and even considering everything into a single ambit it goes against the ethos of our constitution it it, it it shows there is an ignorance of political diversity of our country and we should respect the democratical ideas we should respect the constitutional ideas but conducting single election goes beyond uh, goes against this idea of uh, democracy goes against this idea of federalism and here uh, an instance has been mentioned also see in the state government the chief minister of a state government they have a power to recommend dissolution of the state legislature and they can call for early election and this has happened uh, with respect to telangana in 2018 but by going for a single election this is going to take away this right of chief minister of a state government and now union government will be having the power to dictate election schedule uh, to the state this goes against the idea of federalism in our country and the second reason is see the government is giving the example uh, initially in, from 1951 to 1961 in our country we had a simultaneous election both the state assembly elections and the lok sabha elections they used to happen together see that happened not by the design it happened because of the process because all the state assembly election lok sabha election is started together at that time governments were stable and the tenure were also 5 years so all of them used to have elections together but after 1967 many regional parties have started and there were changes in tenure there were instable governments even at the lok sabha and the uh, state assemblies also this somewhere changed this uh, simultaneous elections it shows that it is a testament of indian plur plurality but if government want to go back again to the same thing that too by design this is considered as a regressive move and this regressive move you cannot forcibly resynchronize the election schedule this is going to affect the working of state governments it is going to affect the working of state legislature also so this is the second reason and third reason is cost analysis see another reason government is giving is it is going to reduce the cost of the election now the cost, since there will be separate election for assembly separate election for lok sabha the cost of the conducting elections are very high but here the authors have given a uh, uh, data also that cost saving is not valid if you look at the data according to niti aayog data and election commission of india data the cost per voter to conduct election is 10 rupees per person and if the simultaneous elections happens then the cost is going to reduce to 5 rupees per person see it is not a big number it is not a big amount when you think as a, as a protection for indian federalism and when you think it from the perspective of political diversity and even from a uh, financial perspective also in a short term you need more uh, voting machines you need more uh, administrative equipments to conduct elections together and in a short term it is going to increase the expenses rather than what we are aiming for redu reduction of financial expenses so even from the perspective of cost saving it is not up to the mark it is it is going to have the same cost whether it is a simultaneous or the different uh, election conduction in a short term it is going to increase the expenses due to new voter machines and other logistics issues and a fourth reason the article has given why uh, the, this one election even from the economic perspective it is not a good idea see when the uh, elections happen these political parties and the candidate they spend lot of money during elections and this money this is going to enter into our economy and this will push a private consumption in our country by pushing private consumption these elections are giving stimulus to our economy 
on the whole these elections act as a driver for our economic situation in our country so we should take advantage of it rather than manipulating or discouraging this activity and the next point is see, single election is it is not going to work for parliamentary system it is good for a presidential system where the executive is not dependent on a legislative executive is not needed legislative ma majority but in indian parliamentary system we need that legislative support for proper working of executive executive is a part of legislature so indian parliamentary system we have a diverse democracy in order to protect this diverse, diverse democracy we cannot go for an idea of a one nation one election concept in turn it is going to be a detrimental factor for the development prospectus of our country and finally the article the authors have given a conclusion the whole idea of one nation one ele election is mainly it is based on a cost saving and it is based on po policy paralysis and governance interference see what government argument is we are going to we, we can save a lot of uh, money with a uh, one election and even policy uh, paralysis can be avoided there will not be model code of conduct again and again so it is directly going to uh, impact the developmental process and even the governance interference will not be there if there is the one nation a uh, one election concept is uh, pushed but here uh, the article it concludes that see this idea is politically unfeasible and administratively also it is unworkable and constitutionally we are a federal country and we are a democratic parliamentary democratic country it goes against this ethos of our constitution and it is a constitutionally unviable proposition uh, this is it about this article let's move to the next editorial the next editorial is about climate change and its effects on women and here in this uh, editorial it has been mentioned that we need to focus on women led climate actions especially emerging countries emerging economies should focus on women led climate action now let's get into the discussion of this the article starts with a observation made by OECD. See, it, it, here it has been mentioned gender equality and environmental goals are mutually reinforcing and create a virtuous circle that will help accelerate the achievement of SDG, that is Sustainable Development Goals. The idea of gender equality and the environment goals, they have that influence on each other. We need to balance that whether to achieve the target of environmental goals or the uh, concept of gender equality in our society. When this idea, these concepts have been balanced, then it will help us to achieve the sustainable development goals. And this is what has been mentioned by OECD. That is Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. We have been seeing this news that climate change has become a, one, of the, one among the major global challenges in the recent decade and we have been uh, uh, studying about the effects and we, even we are taking various steps to address this climate change uh, issues. But the thing is somewhere we are ignoring the concept of women who are highly vulnerable for this climate change and we are ignoring the idea that these women are disproportionately affected by climate change. And it is the time that we should take it very seriously. See half of the population around the world if you look at it, it is uh, women only. And how nearly half of the population are affected by this climate change activity. So it is our duty that we need to focus, we need to make sure that they are not vulnerable for these climate change activities. And because of these uh, climate change issues, women are going to face some of the issues, maybe a risk, uh, risk to their health and there may be safety concerns also, they, it is going to affect their quality of life also. So it is a time that we need to focus on women also when it comes to the actions related to climate change. Here in this article, the it mainly focuses on women, especially from low income countries and developing countries. From introduction, we got to know that women are directly going to be affected. Women are vulnerable with respect to climate change activities. But the thing is, women in developing and underdeveloped countries, they are much more vulnerable to this uh, climate change. Because in these countries, they are directly dependent on natural resources and they are involved in labor intensive work for their livelihood. So it is directly going to affect their physical performances there it is directly going to affect their health perspective also and if you look at it they are more likely to live in poverty than men 
If you look at the underdeveloped low income country scenario where the women are responsible for food, if they are responsible for water and other homely work and all these work they are unpaid only. See if the climate change activity it has impacted the underground water level or the water resources then it is the burden for these women to fetch the water and most of these women in these countries they are mainly involved in agriculture related activities so even their responsibility for food is also going to be increased and it is not only going to affect their physical well-being even it is going to affect their psychological well-being also and the, there was a report from ILO that is International Labour Organization where it has mentioned that over 60% of the working women especially in a southern Asian region and sub-Saharan region, sub-Saharan African region, they are still working in agriculture sector only. And if there is a minute change in the natural availability of natural resources, then it is going to extend their labor intensive work. They have to put more effort to have a same work to be get done. Since we know that they are already underpaid, they are already, some of the work are unpaid also, especially household work and they are already overworked and this is going to increase the burden on women, especially in these low income countries. So, it is time that we have to take proper step to address this issue. The next issue is because of this climate change activities, because of this climate change related disaster, it is going to create some gender specific issues. And there is a data, data according to UN United Nations, the people who are displaced due to climate related disasters, among them 80% are women only. This shows that how vulnerable this uh, group of people, especially the women. When the people are displaced, when they are uprooted from their, uh, whether it's a village or the place where they stay, they are going to face the exploitation and they are going to face some gender specific issues and we need to focus on it and we need to work towards to eliminate these issues. See, there will be a separation from social networks. It is a new place. They are very vulnerable for exploitation and there is higher risk of gender based violence and there will be a, dis a, a decreased access to the employment. Mainly women in these regions, they are dependent on agricultural activities only and their uh, area of working is already restricted and on top of it, if they are displaced from a place, it is going to further reduce, further decrease their access to employment. And there will be an issue with respect to uh, education also. They are not going to get essential health services, especially sexual and reproductive health care is difficult to get. And even if it is uh, available, it is difficult to afford for these women. And there is a lack of psychosocial support also. So, these gender specific issues need to be addressed because the main cause for all these things is a climate change disasters. So, we need to focus on uh, the primary cause which is causing all these things. And also, if you look at it, especially in uh, uh, Asian and uh, Southern Asian and Sub-Saharan uh, African region, women, they make up large for, uh, portion of agriculture workforce. And because of this climate change uh, activities, they are going to face a heat stress and they are, there will be changing precipitation pattern also. This is directly going to affect the agricultural workforce and the pattern they work there. And there will be extreme weather events. There may be over... Uh, raining or there may be drought kind of situation and the main burden comes uh, to the women only who are managing all these uh, agricultural uh, activities. This shows that women farmers and women laborers, they are vulnerable and they are going to be seriously impacted. The, the first thing is we need to focus on low income countries. We need to make sure that these uh, people, the women in these uh, low income countries, they are not much vulnerable. Proper cushion, ha cushion has to be given. The proper shock observing activity has to be taken so that they are, they will not be much vulnerable. And second aspect is gender specific related issues that will be uh, going to happen because of climate uh, related activities that has to be taken care of. And finally, what what needs to be done? The article talks about what are the steps as a world community and for that matter, domestic governments also. What are the steps need to be done? Here, some of the points have been mentioned.
the article talks about four points the first thing is see priority should be given to the women education and proper investments have to be happen with respect to women education and there will be a aspect of training also so this will make them self sufficient this will help them to learn various skills and in turn it is going to help their employment opportunities and there should be access to resources also so priority should be on these three education training and access resource so that women will not be vulnerable when it comes to the earn, earning their own livelihood and the second step is uh, there should be a teaching there uh, teaching them how to practice uh, sustainable agriculture and how to do water management these are extremely necessary see in our country major chunk of agricultural activities are handled by women only if they had an idea regarding sustainable agriculture and water management it is going to help them only at individual level and also at the larger social level also then there is an example also been mentioned here seva it is a group and this group it teaches women farmers how to respond to a clean, uh, changing climate and these kind of various ngos or civil society organization they should come forward and they should collaborate with these women and guide them for a activity related sustainable agri uh, agriculture or water management activities and the third practice is there should be an investment in environmental friendly farming practices this is also need of the hour even not only for women oriented even in general we need this approach we need proper environment friendly uh, farming practices and we need to support those groups who work in this uh, arena who works uh, to generate awareness with respect to sustainable farming or we we generate awareness with respect to environmental friendly farming practices one thing we should support that investment and also we should support those groups who work from this perspective and finally women participation in climate policy decision making is also very much important see women are one among the important stakeholders when it comes to the climate change activities so they should also participate in the policy decision making their voice should also be heard and there should be a gender parity when it comes to the decision making of all these sorts so these are the four points have been mentioned in this article and finally conclusion have been given that we can say that developing and emerging countries urgently need women led climate action the where the topic started it the exact on the same point this article has ended let's move to the next article the next editorial is regarding g20 and india be acting as a voice to the global south in g20 uh, there are some good points in this article uh, let's get into the discussion of this india is hosting g20 this time in delhi and the theme of this g20 is vasudeva kutumbakam that is one earth one family and one future in this summit india is highlighting the concerns of global south india is giving platform for the global south to have the discussion with the developed countries to have the discussion with the emerging economies also and india is pushing for reviving reforming and defending the globalization see if you look at the present scenario around the world the developed countries somewhere they are going they are supporting for the idea of deglobalization and this g20 india is pushing for the idea of globalization that we need revival of this globalization we need reformation in this globalization and also india is defending globalization it is taking action it is voicing its uh, uh, action against the idea of deglobalization and this globalization it, it it is an idea it connects the entire world it makes the world borderless and it talks about interconnection of cultures across the geographies and india is watching for this globalization as being a president of a g20 india is pushing for three ideas here and these three ideas have been discussed in this article let's see one after the other the first focus point of india under its presidency for g20 is democratization and decentralization of global economy as i said before if you look at the developed countries now they are going back to the uh, deglobalization idea they are reverting to deglobalization somewhere they think that because of globalization we have been exploited our resources has been exploited so we should go for uh, strict nationalization strict nationalism where we should support our domestic uh, 
companies to be work within our borders only so if you look at it the steps taken by countries especially like usa they have passed inflation reduction act in turn this act is going to support deglobalization and even the act of even the steps taken by european union that is carbon border tax even this is pushing for deglobalization sorry it is not pushing for deglobalization it is restricting the globe idea of globalization so it is these are the indirect activities these are the indirect rules and regulations taken by usa EU, eu european union and even other developed countries also so what here author says is see it is going to affect the developing countries it is going to affect emerging economies and especially the poor countries and low income countries will be the uh, victim of this idea of deglobalization so india under its presidency in g20 it is going for the de democratization and decentralization of global economy and how to democratize and how to de decentralize it is going it is pushing globalization agenda it is pushing the idea of globalization of economy and the second focus point is we need that reform and restoration of global finances see if you look at the various international institute financial institutions always they mentions that global growth will be coming from emerging economies and developing countries but are we having that investment in these economies and where are these investment in emerging economies it is not happening up to the mark and even the investment what are happening even they are coming up with some restrictions and regulations so here india is asking the questions that we need to diverse this global finance towards the development of this emerging economies towards the developing uh, development of low income countries but what happening right now is the international finances are focused on transatlantic countries it means that northern america and european countries only somewhere these finances are restricted there only if the finances if the investment is not going to happen for uh, other countries developed and underdeveloped countries where are you going to create that wealth uh, where is the wealth generation is going to happen and another thing is we need to have a wealth generation yes it is uh, we need that finance but at that same time we should go for a uh growth generation also the wealth creation is disconnected from growth creation now that connection has to be reconnected now so that low uh, underdeveloped and developing countries are also going to get advantage and this issue is addressed by india in g20 and the third focus point here is see india has changed g20 into a people's festival before the g20 was mainly dominated by technocrats and it was mainly dominated by policy framers and these had a complete control over g20 and if you look at it whenever the g20 happens in that avenue there will be people protesting against it now what india did is it converted this into a people's festival now people are even the dissent or the uh, points who are against the ideology of g20 even they are also getting the platform they are also discussing these ideas and dialogue on the issues that affect people directly are also been discussed here whether it is health related employment or job related or the adaptations to climate change all these issues were also been discussed under g20 it is not only restricted to economy it is not only restricted to technocrats and policy framers that diversion has been added that diversification have been done to the g20 and this added diversity to the global governance also see these are the three focus point these are the three focal issues india has um, mainly concentrating on and somewhere india is going to be successful in addressing these issues and author says that one of the achievements of india in this year is you know in past g20 summits as i told you before there will always be confrontation by activists outside the venue and they will be shouting against the organization and the uh, uh, countries who are attending these kind of uh, summits but now even these dissent have given a platform and they were also invited for the argument and discussions were also go through with uh, dissent also whether it's opposition run state governments or a marginalized groups or a civil society organization they are also provided platform to discuss these issues india has democratized the idea of g20 india supported this democratization of g20 this is the achievement of india and being uh, the hosting this g20 this is the contribution from indian side towards the success of g20 and finally the author has given a conclusion that see india is respecting the prerogatives of global south india is giving that platform for the these global south countries to put forth their ideas to have that discussion 
with uh, developed countries and along with the global south india is also focusing on green growth india is focusing on technology first growth women led growth and also inclusive growth these objectives these are going to help the global south on a larger arena and because of this for the first time global south is become a pathfinder global south has got the voice now and they are going to be a, a strong stakeholder for greener digital and equitable growth uh, this is it for the day guys i'll see you guys tomorrow uh, this pdf will be available in telegram group netbook study thank you for listening have a good time